it is five o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I thank you all for being here. This is our kickoff lecture for the Energy for a Sustainable Future seminar series. Um, I realize that there are a lot of students here that are here for extra credit. So during the talk, I will place a link in the chat. And when this is an FYU, FYI to you as well, so that if you see something in the chat, um, and it'll collect information from students that we can then provide to instructors if they're, you know, getting credit for attending. So I'll go ahead and move on to introducing uh, Dr. Wynne Fippen. Um, he is a tenured full professor in the School of Agriculture at Western Illinois University. He received his master's degree from Cornell University in plant breeding and a PhD from Purdue University in the new crops breeding program. He went on to establish the alternative crops research program at Western Illinois in August 2000 to investigate new crops for the Midwest and help revitalize local economies. Wynn is the PI for the Multi-Institutional Integrated Pennycrest Research Enabling Farm and Energy Resilience Project, otherwise known as I Prefer. I prefer's mission is to optimize off-season pennycrest oil seed production by overcoming production and supply chain bottle, bottlenecks, ultimately leading to pennycrest oil being converted to a biofuel. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Wynn Fippen, who's going to present to us a new cash cover crop for sustainable aviation fuel. All right, thank you so much, Becca. I appreciate being here and I'm Appreciate being invited and being the inaugural kickoff speaker. So um, what I'm going to try to do today is tell a story about how we got started with Pennycrest. And so today's whole talk is going to focus on Pennycrest. But before I get started, hold on. We need to talk about um, developing new crops. And so I direct the new and alternative crops research program. And so many times when I have a, a field day and I invite producers out and uh, I was trying to come up with new ideas of what crops to grow, um, crops typically can fall into two categories. And the first category is what we call a supply push. So this is something producers can grow really well, but the question is, is, is there somebody out there wanting to buy it? Um, and so one that typically comes up, you know, you'll have a producer come up to you and say, oh, well, I grow the best weeds in town. I can grow water hemp or pigweed. I'm like, that's fantastic if someone would buy it. Um, another crop that might fall into this of late that you might be familiar with is the fiber hemp. So we know producer can grow it and we can grow it well. And we used to grow it quite a bit for the war effort. But the question is, is are there markets established? Are the, is the industry looking for alternative fiber products? That's if, of course, if we're growing hemp for um, fiber production. The flip side of this coin is where we have the industry um, desperately needing a product. And then the question is, can producers produce, supply it uh, to the industry? So if an alternative fiber was needed, an alternative oil or, or a rubber or resin was needed, can we come up with a crop that we can grow? So over the years, I've had some examples of this. Um, so I, I direct the new and alternative crops research program. So I have a very unique position in the state of Illinois where I'm actually mandated not to work on corn, soybean, or wheat. So I have to focus on other crops. And so one crop that uh, came into my lap was common milkweed. You know, here producers felt, oh, we can grow it. That'd be great. Um, and we also had an industry that was demanding and looking for cheap fibers for fill in comforters and pillows. And so if you're familiar with milkweed, it makes a, a, a floss fiber off the seed and it's used as a batting agent in comforters and pillows. Um, and so there was a demand for the product and we're like, all right, well, let's try to grow milkweed. And it turned out that it was actually quite difficult to grow milkweed on purpose on 30 inch rows so it could be harvested. Um, and it ultimately came down to, we didn't have enough pollinators to pollinate a full field of um, milkweed because the, predominator, the predominant pollinator was a bumblebee. And so bumblebees are not hive type insects uh, like the honeybees are. And so it turned out to be very difficult to grow in the middle of a corn and soybean production. A lot of this milkweed production ended up getting moved to Vermont. The other side of the coin is a crop that we worked with. It's called kufia. 
this was sought after because we we're looking for a domestic source for lauric acid, which is in predominantly most soaps and detergents. The industry had approached me and said, you know, is there any way we can grow this here in the United States? And can we start producing our own lauric acid? And so we had several years of breeding and developing protocols, but we just weren't able to get it to grow here in the United States at a reasonable volume that would be suitable for, for industry. So there we had a market pull, but we just couldn't meet it with the, uh, the, the growing. So the latest crop we've come across is Pennycrest, where we're gonna speak mostly for today. Um, and it's, I wanna give you a little bit of a history on it. So the USDA ARS facility in Peoria, Illinois had a researcher, his name was Terry Isbell. He's pictured in that bottom picture. Um, and he was driving home one day from work. And if you took it, this, this photo up in the left-hand corner was the original field that he was driving by and noticed that, wow, those are all weeds out there. And there's one weed that we could actually harvest. And that was Pennycrest. So all the brown in that photo is a Pennycrest field, just a wild field that was growing out there. He got his combine, he harvested it, started crushing some oils from it um, in that middle center photo. And he said, wow, this would make a fantastic, either a biodiesel or aviation fuel. He approached me later on that year and said, hey, Wynn, is there anything you can do with this? So starting in 2009, um, I started a breeding program on Pennycrest, collecting different varieties of Pennycrest, and just answering basic questions is, when should we plant it? Um, what's the seeding rate? What's the planting depth, broadcast, drilling? Um, what are the pollination systems? Is it predominantly self-pollinated or not pollinated, or um, insect pollinated? And so a lot of those studies have led up to us um, building a consortium of researchers with all an interest on trying to advance Pennycrest. And so that brings us to 2019, uh, where we finally built a consortium of researchers um, at Illinois State and other institutions to uh, apply for what we call a USDA CAP proposal, which is a coordinated agricultural product focused specifically on Pennycrest and taking Pennycrest all the way to commercialization. So the I Prefer program is one of many uh, CAP projects. Our project began in 2019 and it will be concluded in 2024. And it was a $10 million project solely focused on commercializing Pennycrest. Um, if you notice in the center of the United States, that red circle circles the area that we're focusing in from Illinois, um, Indiana and Ohio, all the way up through uh, Minnesota as our sort of our research area for the I Prefer project. There are other similar projects to ours uh, that are in the CAP uh, system. Uh, one of our sister projects that works with us is the SPARC program, which is located in the sort of the northern part of Florida and southern Georgia. They're also looking at an oil seed, um, one that's called Caranata, which is Indian mustard, and also for aviation fuels and other biodiesel products. Several of the other car, um, CAP projects are looking at um, forest waste and residues, uh, paper production residues, uh, what to do with beetle killed pine trees. Um, so it's all focused on trying to develop um, some sort of energy source from uh, renewable uh, um, products and, and crops. So our project uh, specifically um, is headed up at Western Illinois University. I direct the program. Uh, then we have colleagues at the University of Minnesota, um, the University of Wisconsin in Platteville, uh, Illinois State, of course, and then Ohio State University, Southern Illinois University. Um, and then our corporate partner, um, who is actually physically doing the commercialization, is named Covercrest. They're out of St. Louis. And then we have a USDA facility, ARS facility out of Morris, Minnesota. And then we have another research uh, institute uh, called the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in, um, in Minnesota, it's called ARI. So those are the partners in the project. Uh, you may recognize some of the names on the list, especially from Illinois State. So Dr. Son Sedbrook, uh, Dr. Nicholas Heller, William Perry, uh, Becca Darner, and uh, Rob Reichert are the leads on our project and then some of the other individuals from the other institutions that are, are helping us out on the project. 
Being a fairly large project, it's important that these CAP projects have a sort of a steering committee. We refer to it as our advisory board. So these are industry professionals that help guide our project and make sure that we are staying on track or whether or not we need to pivot another direction based on either markets or other issues that are occurred during the project. So Mike DeCamp is the CEO of Covercrest. He's the commercializing partner. Uh, we also have Steve Zonka, who is the executive director of the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative called CAFI. Um, um, and then Alan Weber is a, a producer, but also an ag consultant um, out of Missouri. And then Lauren Larkin, also from um, Illinois in the Bloomington area from Illinois Farm Bureau. And she helps us pretty much with environmental and environmental services and working with producers as we uh, go to commercialization. And then Neville Fernandez is with REG, which is the Renewable Energy Group out of Iowa. He will be a, a, a user of oils at the end and producer of oils. Um, and then in the very near future, we'll be adding a Southern producer in the Illinois area and then a Northern producer from uh, the Minnesota region. Um, as Becca mentioned, when we wrote this proposal, we wanted to make sure that our mission was very short and very succinct. Um, you know, up until 2009, until about 2019, uh, we recognized there are going to be some bottlenecks into Pennycrest production. And this project was focused specifically at addressing those bottlenecks. Um, and so the mission is simply to optimize off season Pennycrest oil seed production by overcoming production and supply chain bottlenecks. You know, not only are we developing a new crop, but we're also developing a new system in to handle these very small oil seed crops. Ultimately, the goal for the whole project is to commercially launch Pennycrest as a new cash cover crop in 2021. We were successful in doing so, and I'll show you some photos a little bit later on. All right, so now a little bit more about Pennycrest. Um, so Pennycrest is the common name that I'll be referring to, and this refers to the wild roadside weed that we typically would find in the Midwest. Um, it's closely related. It's in the Thalaspi Arvensi. Um, it's closely related to the brassicas of canola and uh, camelina. And then if you're familiar with Arabidopsis, it's also very similar um, related to that. Um, it is grown all throughout the world in pretty much every temperate region. And we're now finding it even in northern climes up into the tundras of, uh, of Canada and even down in uh, uh, southern South America. Fairly simple genome, it's a diplo genome. It's been fully sequenced and it has an 86% identity with Arabidopsis, so very closely related. Anything what we know on Arabidopsis, we can glean then on Pennycrest. Other attributes that are very uh, helpful is that it's extremely cold tolerance. We've collected Pennycrest all the way up to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and even Tibet, China. Um, it has a very short life cycle, which is great. Um, and it has very high yields of uh, oil and of protein. The other useful, um, and as we introduce a new crop, another important fact is that it, it, it's not evasive and it can be easily controlled. So if it's growing outside of your production fields, it can be controlled. Uh, the photos uh, around are some fields that are grown. One, uh, a naturally occurring field that looks like it's planted, but was in Bloomington, Illinois. Then we have a purposely planted field, 140 acres in Galesburg, Illinois, which is just north of Macomb here. And this gives you an idea of what the plant looks like in the seed size. Um, I threw this in so you get an idea of what we're working with. So hopefully everybody's familiar with soybeans, a fairly large size seed, very easy to plant and very easy to handle. The newer crops that we're dealing with, these small oil seeds are quite a bit smaller. So rapeseed would be the only commercial one that's on the market now that is readily planted and readily handled all throughout Canada and into uh, the Northern United States. So the two new crops coming on are camelina um, and then pennycress. And camelina is actually smaller than pennycress, but notice very high in oil and very high in protein. So why are we looking at Pennycrest specifically? What is that niche that makes it different from other oil seeds? Um, and so as you're familiar, you've been in uh, Illinois for a while now. And so our typical rotation is we've got corn in the fall. And as soon as the corn comes out, we're left with barren ground for most of the year from early October all the way into late May. And then we plant our secondary crop or second crop, which is soybeans. And that's typically our cycle. 
what we're proposing here is, well, is there any way or time for us to be able to squeeze in a crop between these two uh, primary crops? So we initially looked at say canola varieties, perhaps breeding canola to be a lot faster, but canola still just has a very long growing season and it would not be harvested until about the end of June. So that will definitely impact the production of soybeans. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is produce a crop in the off season without impacting the, the two other main crops, which is either corn or soybeans. And so pennycress is the only crop that we have found that actually fits within that cycle uh, very readily. So now what we're proposing is we would have corn followed by um, pennycress followed by soybeans. You can also have pennycress after soybeans if you wanted to and do a soybean pennycress and then um, a shorter season corn in the next season, um, but it's all possible. So ultimately, what is the potential of pennycress? So right now we have uh, 80 million acres in the US corn belt. Um, let's be, these are optimistic numbers. So if we produce 2000 seeds per acre, that would produce about 85 gallons of oil and about 1300 pounds of seed meal. Um, and then ultimately, if we grew pennycress on just 50% of that 80 million, um, we could produce anywhere from up to about 3 billion gallons of, uh, of fuel or oil, essentially. And the important note here is we haven't displaced any other crops. Uh, most other crops, let's say I want to grow canola as a primary crop, I would have to take either soybeans or corn out of production, and that needs to be part of the equation. So all this 3 billion gallons of oil will be done completely off season. So what I wanted to walk through is um, how we grow the crop. So essentially we had established this crop in the fall. Uh, mind you, these are pictures of research plots. So typically there would be corn stubble if this was a production field, but I just wanted to walk through so you have an idea of what it should look like. So by late October, mid uh, November, you should have rosettes out in the field. Um, this happens to be a drilled plot, but it can also be broadcast. Um, and the rosettes should be about the size of a dandelion. They're about uh, six inches uh, across. Um, as I mentioned, it has phenomenal uh, winter survival. So in late March, this is what the plants should be looking at. They're about six inches in diameter. Um, they've come through the winter just fine. These plants can survive easily down to minus 20 degrees, and that's without any snow cover, um, and will actually even do fine completely buried in the snow. Uh, we've had plots that have been completely frozen in ice, and the plants simply do uh, uh, quite well. So at late March, uh, we're coming out of dormancy and we're starting to start the reproductive phase. By mid-April, this goes pretty quickly, the plants will be in full bloom. So we're in full flower from about the first week of April to about mid-April, and then we begin pod production. And then by mid May, you're completely uh, done with pod production and you're beginning uh, the full seed set and you're starting your, your dry down. Uh, this happens to be an image from this year's research plots. Um, and so the, the, all the brown plots represent all the pennycrest plots and research that we did here at, at Western. This is in Macomb, Illinois. Um, and this photo was taken on, on June 1st. Now, before I proceed, I, so far I've been talking about wild pennycress. And so everything you find on the roadside or out in the wild is typically a black seeded variety. These are characterized by very high erucic acid, which is a fatty acid in the oil. It has very high glucosinolates. Uh, glucosinolates is a sulfur containing compound that does help with uh, protecting the plants against insects. Um, and also it has very high fiber. When I start to talk about commercializing pennycress, what I'm actually talking about is commercializing a new variety of pennycress that has been created by the Covercress company and by researchers at the University of uh, Minnesota and at Illinois State through a process called gene editing. And so through these gene editing and other uh, mutagenesis protocols, we've created a crop that we are now uh, trademarking as Covercress. So Covercress is a golden seeded variety. Um, it has low uracic acid, low glucosinolates, and low fiber. 
Um, the reason this variety was created was to not only create oil that can go into the fuel market, but also to create a high value protein meal for poultry, swine, and cattle. If we had just ground the wild pennycress, it still makes a great oil, but unfortunately because of the high glucosinolates and the high urucic acid, it would not be palatable for livestock. And so by knocking out uh, the high urucic um, and some of the glucosinolates, we can get now a, a variety that we get both oil and seed meal for uh, the livestock industry. So when I refer to golden varieties, I'm referring to covercress. And if I refer to a black seeded variety, I'm referring to the wild, what we call a wild variety. Um, later on in this seminar series, uh, another guest speaker will be from Covercress. Um, his name is Ratan Chopra, and he'll be discussing all the, um, the breeding that has occurred to develop these new Covercress lines. Um, so this talk today, I was not going to get into mentioning each individual gene that's being modified and how it's being modified to create today's commercial varieties. Uh, but on the breeding side of things, as the Covercrest company uh, moves forward and develops new varieties, part of the I Prefers project um, is to evaluate them. How well are they doing in the breeding program and how well are the other plant breeders working? Um, and so we have seed that's coming in from um, Illinois State, from Western Illinois University, the University of Minnesota, and from uh, Covercrest. Um, just this year, we were able to grow at nine different locations. Um, throughout Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, um, and in Minnesota. Uh, and just some examples. So these are the top 10 breeding lines that are grown at all of uh, these nine locations. Um, and then they're harvested and then all the seed is analyzed and processed. So the exciting news is that uh, the varieties did quite well across all these varieties. So you're looking at data that's representing an aggregate of all the locations together. Um, and, the, and I'd like to bring bars represented in gold color are golden varieties and the gray bars are my black seeded varieties that haven't um, had their um, seed coat ch color changed to uh, uh, a golden color. So B28WG and B48WG and the B3WG are cover crest commercial lines. Um, that performed quite well. And these would be the first commercial lines that would be released um, in commercialization. If you notice the average across all areas was about 1600 pounds, um, which is quite good. Um, and the economic threshold for successful production is 1500 pounds. Um, and I would like to mention that 2022 was a, a fairly challenging year for us only because it was a fairly dry fall when this was planted and it was a very wet spring. Um, so in a challenging year, it was nice to see that some of these varieties actually performed quite well, um, even under the, uh, the challenging uh, situation. Uh, we did notice across these state trials that we do get variability, a yield gradient from south to north. Uh, that makes sense only because in the southern climes in southern Illinois, uh, we have a little bit longer growing season um, and a little bit more heat units to get uh, the plant up bigger. Uh, the Covercrest lines are the golden varieties, uh, the, the three that I mentioned earlier, all performed well across all varieties, and the B28WG ended up being the top performers across all the varieties. We did have one black seeded variety developed from the University of Minnesota. It has three uh, unique genes that have been added to it, and it averaged actually 1,373 um, pounds per acre. As part of the Side Prefer project, not only do we focus on breeding and developing varieties, uh, we also have to conduct numerous agronomy trials to make sure that our crop or varieties can fit into the commercial production that is, is going on. Uh, so led by Nicholas Heller, we had a project looking at corn residue management. So, you know, this is a fairly small seeded crop. And if we're trying to get it into corn residue, essentially following corn, how can we manage that residue so we get a better establishment of the crop? Uh, we recognized fairly early on in pennycrest production that getting fall establishment following corn was going to be a challenge because there's so much material there. Um, so Nicholas looked at treatments where we uh, followed um, 
silage corn where a lot of the, the material was removed uh, and other treatments. And he also looked at uh, the differences, if there were any, between black seeded and golden seeded varieties. Russ Gesh at the USDA ARS in Morse, Minnesota looked at corn relative maturity. Could we start looking at different corn varieties and pairing corn varieties with Pennycrest so we could make sure that Pennycrest got on in the fall earlier or perhaps um, um, allowed us to minimize the residue that was on, on, the, on the field? Um, so Russ looked at multiple different uh, corn varieties, different day length varieties at four different locations from Lexington, Illinois, Custer, Ohio, Morris, Minnesota, and then Rosemont, Minnesota. One other challenge is we know we're following corn and corn has several uh, prescribed herbicide programs to help control weeds in corn. If we're gonna follow corn with pennycress, we have to make sure that the carryover of any herbicides used in corn would not impact pennycress production. Dr. Mark Bernards at Western Illinois University, who's a weed scientist, studied the different uh, cocktails or active ingredients of common corn herbicides and how they would impact uh, pennycress in terms of yield production. There are a few that have a, a big impact on pennycress. Um, Corvus and uh, Caprino obviously had a big impact. So this is yield of pennycress. Um, and so if the, if the yield stay reasonably high, uh, it had a very um, small impact on pennycress compared to the untreated. Whereas if there was a, a huge hit on the pennycress, then there might be some sensitivity to uh, pennycress. So that's something else that needs to be taken into consideration as we look for producers on pennycress. Alex Lindsay at Ohio State University is focusing on seed treatments. You know, this is a fairly small seeded uh, crop. How can we get better soil to seed contact when we plant in, in the fall? Um, and he studied different pelleting treatments. Can we put a clay treatment or perhaps a, a growth hormone treatment, something called GA on the seed to help improve stand establishment in the fall? So he looked at several different um, pelleting techniques um, using fungicides, um, growth hormones um, to get a better establishment. If you're interested in some of his research throughout my talk, I'll have QR codes. Um, and if you would like to see the articles on some of this, you're welcome to scan the QR code and that should take you right to the article. Finally, up in Minnesota, uh, they are very much interested in trying to uh, follow penny, I mean, follow soybeans. And so now they're looking at are there varieties of soybeans that can be matched with pennycress and start looking at intercropping um, pennycress into soybeans and vice versa. Um, and so Aaron Lorenz at University of Minnesota is looking at uh, selecting different um, soybean varieties and how well they uh, are can be interceded with, with pennycress to get one crop uh, established while the other one is growing. Along with the agronomy, we have ecosystem services. This is headed by Bill Perry at uh, Illinois State University. Um, and he essentially we're pitching pennycress as a cash cover crop. So what does a cover crop mean? What does that do for the environment? Um, it's hard enough to try to convince producers to grow cover crops, but it's more difficult to sort of um, educate the producers on what that actually means. What does this actually mean for your farm in terms of helping reduce weeds, immobilize nutrients that are in the field, um, minimizing nitrogen runoff, also improving soil health and soil organic matter, especially when we come to uh, carbon sequestration and of course, reduce any uh, soil erosion. You know, in most of this farm field, so these are images from the Lexington farm. Um, in this green area in March 22, this is pennycress production. But if you look at all the other fields, they're left fallow. And so what can pennycress do as a, a cover crop to help uh, improve the environmental impact? And so that's what Bill Perry is looking at. We also have Dr. Rob Reichert at Illinois State, who is also looking at uh, pennycress crop rotations, but he's looking at several other crops and how they compare to pennycress. Um, and he's most interested in, in identifying what's the intensity or the carbon intensity of growing these different crops. Um, so crops can be rated in terms of how much energy it takes to produce that crop. 
Um, and so when we start thinking about making fuel products, you know, if we're making jet fuel and it's based on a petroleum basis, it takes about 90 uh, CO2 energy out of uh, megajoules. Um, and, when renew and when we compare that to renewable jet, it's significantly less to produce a renewable crop than it is a petroleum-based crop. So Rob is looking at um, the carbon sequestration of different uh, cover crops. We also have a collaborator up in Minnesota looking at, well, what's the impact gonna be on, on pollinators? Pennycrest flowers at a time when there's very, other, very few other crops uh, that are actually flowering on the landscape. So early April, um, and so this could actually lead to improving pollinator health. So Frank Frisella uh, did a study looking at either golden varieties or black seeded varieties and looking at the visitors of these plants and are we improving the health of these um, pollinators? The next group in the project focuses on supply chain. You know, we're producing lots of small seed and this is the first time the industry really has to deal with this. The next closest crop is uh, rapeseed and canola, but they're, they're twice the size of pennycress. So how do we handle these really small seeds? So as we bring pennycress uh, to market, there are several things the supply chain team has been working on. And that's first trying to bring our, um, the, the crop scouting and the decision-making tools uh, to the digital level. Um, and this allows farmers to uh, be able to make decisions on if they don't have a good stand establishment in the fall, that they can simply use pennycress as a cover crop and then till it under in the spring and then go ahead and plant your soybeans. But if stand establishment was good and sufficient, they can carry pennycress all the way to maturity and then do the harvest and then follow with uh, uh, soybeans as necessary. But as we think about handling pennycress, if we start producing tons and tons of pennycress seeds, it's very small. Um, if you've ever visited a, a farm production field or a grain elevator, you know the floors in the bottom of those bins are quite large because they just need to hold corn or soybeans. Pennycress seed would fall right through it. So what do we need to do to improve storageability of pennycress in terms of screens for uh, grain storage? Also for screens in the back of combines as they're sifting and cleaning as we're harvesting. And one thing that we hadn't thought about is uh, we were just gonna put seed into bags. And if you were gonna sow planting seed into bags, single stitch bags aren't able to hold small seeds. So we have to look at other um, sowing methods to keep the seams on the bags from spilling seeds. So this is a double um, stitching a sewing machine that allows us to do that. And then we're also looking at how do you handle um, um, seed storage, ultimately for the breeding programs and for planting seed. What, what is the optimal seed uh, moisture and storage temperatures? And so that's everything that the supply chain is working on. Covercrest has been doing several hundred acres of um, commercial demonstration plots, several thousand, I should say, uh, production plots. And we're to the point now we're beyond the pilot plants uh, level where we're filling semis now. And that gives us sufficient seed material that we now can start looking at uh, uh, developing an inventory of uh, different equipment that would be needed on the farm. I should mention Pennycrest can be handled by a, a standard combine. Um, of course, with the screens in the back of the combine uh, being uh, uh, replaced with smaller screens, um, but the reel and the head and the machine itself uh, needs no other modifications. Obviously, grain storage and grain handling equipment um, can handle pennycress, but the floors need to be adjusted in order to handle the seeds. And then most other equipment from bagging to conveyors all can handle pennycress uh, just fine. And finally, the last group of the project is, so we're doing all this research in all these different groups from the breeding, the agronomy, the ecosystem services, and the supply chain is, so how do we get that information out to students, out to producers, um, and even um, grade school children and 4-H groups? And so this is the group headed up by uh, Becca Darner at um, Illinois State. Um, she not only helps uh, coordinate some of the grower meetings and field days in terms of evaluations. So each time we have an event out in a field or a, you know, a plot tour or even just media days, whenever we have visitors to our field, uh, she produces a, 
an, an evaluation or a survey that the attendees can take. Um, what did you know prior to coming and what do you know now that you have visited the field day? Um, she's also been a very big part of the, the whole entire team has been a big part of creating a 4-H a project book. Um, this is a book that uh, teaches students about cover crops um, and it's been recently adopted by the Illinois 4-H and is now working on different 4-H cover crop projects with Pennycrest included. Um, one exciting part of our program and you know, I'm speaking to a lot of students and if you happen to be a sophomore, junior and you're interested in a summer internship, uh, one of the exciting programs is we offer uh, summer internship programs, fully paid for uh, summer internship programs um, at each one of our locations. Um, and if you're interested in uh, environmental impact or supply chain issues or even outreach uh, work or even breeding work, um, there are internships available um, and Becca Donner would be one that you would want to talk to. Um, this has been a fairly successful program and um, the students really enjoyed this opportunity of being able to see what team research is all about. You'll have a chance to visit different sites um, and then attend an annual meeting. Uh, one of the other outcomes that came out was a, a classroom staging guide. So if you've taken agronomy course, one of the most important things you can learn is how to stage different crops. So typically it's soybeans or corn and what the different stages are, V stages versus R stages. Um, and we now have that uh, produced for uh, Pennycrest. So that allows producers to start staging and identifying the different stages uh, of Pennycrest. Um, just recently this summer, um, Dr. Reichert and Dr. Sedbrook and I and uh, two other collaborators uh, wrote a nice review article. It's called From Farm to Flight, and it's uh, Covercrest is a low carbon intensity cover crop for sustainable aviation fuel production. And this is a review of the progress that we've made towards commercialization. You know, this has been about 10 years in the making of everything we've learned and where we're headed. Um, if you're interested in this article, there's a, a QR code that you can scan um, and it gives a nice overview of um, the work that's been done and where we're headed in terms of commercializing Pennycress. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the primary goal of the project was to commercialize Pennycress in 2021. Uh, so this image is from uh, 2021 in Aaronsville, Illinois. Um, that is our plot combine, and we're harvesting the first commercial seed for planting. Um, and so this was quite exciting. This, this particular plot yielded actually over 2,000 pounds per acre, um, but it was an exciting first step in the whole commercialization process. Um, and this was to provide seed for the first um, slate of uh, production here in, in central Illinois. So now more on the commercialization side. So there's been a lot of announcements lately. So the commercial partner on our project was Covercrest. This was a small venture capital group um, that was in, based out of St. Louis, uh, made up predominantly of uh, retired executives from Monsanto who really brought a strong management team to bringing Pennycrest um, uh, to commercialization. They had tremendous experience of working with crops and what it takes to take a new crop and bring it to commercialization. Um, so within the recent years, uh, they've done uh, quite a few uh, uh, calls for investments and they've had some wonderful announcements that came out. One was an announcement from Bungie and from Chevron to support um, Covercrest production and essentially provided C1 funding to Covercrest as predominantly a farm to fuel supply chain. So Bungie is a seed handler. Uh, they purchase the seed from the producers um, and then, or from Covercrest. And then the material is gonna be passed on to a, a processor that would then uh, convert it into an oil product. Um, and that would be Renewable Energy Group. And then finally, Chevron is gonna be the buyer that will then make that into an aviation fuel or uh, other projects. Um, the exciting thing is, in the United States is taking a new push towards to preventing, or not preventing, or providing sustainable aviation fuels. Um, but one of the limiting steps in this entire process is not only do we have to grow these crops and get a supply sufficient for producing fuel, but you have to have manufacturers and refineries 
that can handle this side seed and from renewable sources. So there's actually very few facilities in the United States. There's actually only two um, that can meet these uh, criteria of high volume, small seeded, and be able to make sustainable aviation fuels. So this uh, announcement that was came out was from Chevron, and it was to contribute funds into converting some of their existing equipment to be able to handle um, uh, the small seeded cover crest crop. Um, and so the two main for refineries that are going to be changed is Destran in Louisiana and one down in Cairo in Illinois. And they're contributing $600 million to convert these plants over to handling um, penny crests, or in this case, cover crest crop. Um, as cover crest moves forward, we know it's going to take some time for these refineries to get back up to scale. These refineries won't be in. Um, um, uh, operation until about 2026, 2027. So um, Covercrest's approach is, well, if we if the refineries are not going to accept the seed for oil, are there other markets where we can market our seed um, while we're waiting for these refineries? And so the graph in the middle, essentially, uh, is focusing on from 2023 to about 2026, and it's actually taking the whole grain, this is not crushing it for the oil, but keeping it as a whole grain and feeding it directly to poultry. So it would become a poultry feed. This would allow Covercrest to develop the supply chain equipment that's necessary for a large volume of materials and have a, an end producer while we're waiting for the refineries. As the refineries start to come online, there'll be a shift from the whole grain market more over to the crushing to get oil and separating out the seed meal that can then go on for um, uh, oil and for um, uh, livestock feed as needed. Covercrest is taking a very deliberate approach to commercializing pennycress. It's not something they're gonna say, all right, everybody can grow it and everybody within the region is growing it. Um, as we slowly build the supply chain, um, Covercrest, remember, is based out of St. Louis, so it's about this, this area of Missouri, right outside of Illinois. The green area is going to be their initial launch area. There's two reasons they're doing this. One, it's close to them, and they can uh, be able to, the uh, agronomy support folks can keep an eye on those producers a little bit closer. And also, right now, there's only two or three people that are receiving Covercrest grain. Um, and the farther you have to truck this material, it adds cost to the material. So most receivers are going to be in the central Illinois area in the Decatur um, area. And so everything has to be within a certain mileage of Decatur and that's in the Missouri area. So we can deal with grain. As more uh, producers and grain handlers come on board, we can start spreading it out. And so it'll go into the light gray areas and then ultimately going out to the, the yellow areas as um, more and more folks come on board and more agricultural services that become familiar with Pennycrest come on board. The most exciting news that just came out, uh, came out on August 1st. Um, and this was uh, an announcement that Bear Crop Sciences was uh, purchasing Covercrest and buying out all the investors. And so now Covercrest is part of the Bear portfolio. And, um, and we'll continue on with Pennycrest, but under uh, Bear Crop Science. If you're interested in this announcement, there is a QR code for you to take a look at. This is really exciting news. So this is really taking Pennycrest from this idea of a weed seed out in a production field uh, all the way to commercialization. And now we have major partners uh, looking to move this crop forward. All right. So now I'm sort of need to take this back into uh, reality. What does this all mean? And what is the driver between growing Pennycrest? So in September of 2021, the Biden administration held a sustainable aviation summit uh, and they simply announced something called the Sustainable Aviation or the SAF Grand Challenge. And this grand challenge was in the very near term to produce 430 million gallons per year by 2030. That 430 million is only 10% of the US demand for aviation fuel. The ultimate long-term goal uh, of the administration is to produce 100% of the 
of U.S. aviation fuel by 2050. So to put that in perspective, that's 42 billion gallons of fuel a year. That's an incredible amount of fuel just for the United States. If we look on the world level, so worldwide aviation fuel consumption is, was about 95 billion acres in two, um, two billion gallons in 2019. Now, COVID came along and obviously diminished air travel. It dropped to about 52 billion in 2020. It's increased to 57 billion by 2021. And, and they're projecting that by 2023, if COVID is officially over, that uh, traveling is going to resume and we'll be back up into the 80, 90 billion gallons uh, a year. So what does this mean for new oilseed crops? So we talked about Covercrest and on a really good year with very optimistic yields of 2000 pounds per acre, the best Covercrest could do in the commercialization area is about 3 billion gallons. All right, 3 billion of 42 billion per year just for the United States sounds like, well, that's hardly anything. Well, we're also going to need help from the other oilseed crops. So the other sister projects that we're working with, working on Camelina and Coronada, also have about uh, an annual potential of about 3 billion gallons. So with the three oilseeds together, that's about 9 billion gallons or a quarter of the demand, the U.S. demand. So even that does not meet uh, the full sustainability. So there needs to be other feedstocks. Oilseed is not going to be the end all to end all, um, and neither will all the other oil seeds. Now, can soybeans or sunflowers or canola also contribute? Probably. But we're also going to need other projects to be successful looking at biomass or crop residues or even forest residues, um, sawdust, materials like that, um, all to contribute to be able to get to this 100% sustainable aviation fuel. So it's not just one crop that's going to do it. It's going to take multiple crops, and it's going to take a multiple prong approach to sort of address these issues in the aviation industry in terms of just meeting this demand. The, the volume is just astronomical. Uh, finally, I'd like to wrap up. So I told you a little bit about the I Prefer project that was a $10 million project, and its objective was simply to commercialize Pennycrest. Um, another project that you're going to hear about later on in the seminar series is a project that's headed by Dr. Sedbrook at uh, Illinois State called the I Prep project. And this is focused more specifically on breeding and developing varieties of Pennycrest that are improved for abiotic stresses. And by abiotic stresses, I mean anything to do with environmental stresses. So heat stress, water stress, um, cold stress, um, even water logging and things like that, um, using molecular approaches to help uh, um, facilitate the breeding program and develop new varieties. The more breeding we do and the uh, advancement in terms of dealing with uh, environmental stresses, the larger the production range will be, and we can start migrating into perhaps farther north latitudes or even farther south latitudes for heat stress varieties. Um, we have also both uh, Illinois State and Minnesota and WIU have received two USDA DOE grants over the last couple of years. Um, each of those projects were about a million dollars a piece. So if we add this all up, I mean, that's about $25 million of research funding um, on the federal level that have gone into developing pe uh, Pennycrest. Um, and that's above and beyond any state funding. Illinois State has helped quite a bit, the Illinois Soybean Association, uh, along with the Minnesota State um, government has also funded uh, part of a, a program that uh, the Minnesota folks are working with called the Forever Green Project. So I know I went through this fairly quickly. Um, if you're interested to find out more about the I Prefer project, um, there is a QR code here for the I Prefer program, especially if you're interested in the internship program. Um, that new program for the 2023 summer will be coming out here shortly. Uh, so look for it in the fall or speak, simply speak to Becca Darner or Rob Reichert or John Sedbrook if you're interested in those uh, uh, internships.